I'm particularly excited that um, we have a, a beautiful and very fitting evening lecture for this last day of the International Feuchtwanger Society Conference. Um, Heike Specht will talk about women of Wähler and the, about the Feuchtwanger women. Uh, for those of you who don't know Heike, Heike Specht studied history and German literature in Erlangen and in Munich. Her PhD thesis, Die Feuchtwangers, Familie, Tradition und jüdisches Selbstverständnis, won the Hochschulpreis der Landeshauptstadt München. Specht worked for several years as a senior editor at Random House in Munich. Now she lives in Zurich. Her latest book, Die Ersten ihrer Art, Frauen verändern die Welt, about female political leaders in the last 100 years, was published this spring. Currently, she works on a history of the Feuchtwangers, through the told through the women of the family and who, if you are on twitter you can also follow heike i highly recommend it she uh, also has very worthwhile and important tweets so please welcome with me heike Specht. <laughs> good evening or good afternoon um the last two days revolved around leon feuchtwanger himself his work, and yes, the women in his life, for that matter, we pretty much stayed in the 20th century. But the history of Feuchtwanger's family goes back much, much further than that. In fact, we can reconstruct it well back into the late 18th century, when the ancestors of Leon Feuchtwanger lived in the large and flourishing Jewish community of the Bavarian town of Fürth also a potential place where we could hold a, a conference, I just, just realized. Um, how influential the Jews in Fürth actually were illustrates an episode from the late 17th century. The local night watchmen began their call every evening with Gute Nacht, ihr lieben Christen, good night, you dear Christians. The Jewish community, however, took offense at that and made a submission to the city council. And in fact, shortly thereafter, the call was changed into Gute Nacht, ihr lieben Herren. Good night, you dear gentlemen. <laughs> this story surely speaks for the self-confidence of the vital Jewish community of Fürth. Whether the Jewish women of Fürth, uh, the women, women of Fürth took offense in the phrasing is not reported. After all, Jewish or Christians, they were not addressed by the uh, late uh, watchman's call at all. This exclusion of women of Fürth leads us smoothly and directly to the theme of this evening. What I want to do tonight, or this afternoon actually, at the end of this wonderful conference that was organized so thoughtfully and generously uh, by the University of California, uh, Southern California and the Feuchtwanger Memorial Library, namely Michaela Ullmann and uh, Maya Schutz-Coburn. Uh, oh. Thank you. And of course, uh, our guests uh, today, uh, Claudia Gordon and Sh um, Friedel Schmoranzer from the Villa Aurora, and of course, the International uh, Feuchtwanger Society. Uh, so what I want to do tonight is a tour de femme that takes us back to the beginnings of the Feuchtwanger dynasty. And I know dynasty is a big word. <coughs> of course, the Feuchtwangers were not the Winzers and not even the Rot Rothschilds, but you get the picture. Anyhow, this Tour de Femme sheds light of the 50% of the family that have been left in the shadow for too long. But I would argue, without their perspective, their contribution, their side of the story, we don't really understand what the Feuchtwangers were all about. So let's begin. One story told over and over again in the Feuchtwanger family was that Auguste Feuchtwanger, Ne Hahn, from Frankfurt, brought the ugliness into the family. An untold story, however, remains that without the business connections, the dowry, and yes, also the know-how that Auguste provided when she married Jakob Löw Feuchtwanger from Fürth in 1850, the family business would never have flourished in the way it did. Her dowry, 18,000 gulden, made almost two thirds of Feuchtwanger's starting capital when he set out to open a banking business of his own in Munich, the aspiring royal capital of Bavaria. And Auguste was no exception. 
to argue that the men of the Feuchtwanger family married up is a huge understatement. Without Auguste, Fanny, Johanna, and other women we will come across in the next 40 minutes, there would not have been a flourishing private bank or an innovative, successful margarine factory in Munich that made the ascent of the family in the late 19th century from Wirtschafts to Bildungsbürgertum possible in the first place. What I want to show tonight is that the women of the family have, be, have been influential in more than one way. And I would argue without them, ugly or pretty, there would not have been a Feuchtwanger dynasty at all. Still, as I mentioned, contrary to the assumed looks of poor Auguste, which have been subject to speculation time and time again, this facet of the story is strangely untold. The fact that the women of this family, and not just this family, I might add, were valuable stakeholders is gravely underexposed. One reason for that is that women are absent in many sources. For a long time in history, married women were not allowed to own or establish a business. They were not fully legally competent. They were not allowed to be members of clubs, associations, parties. They were not allowed on the board of the Jewish community. Therefore, like in many other histories or families or family histories, one tends to get the impression that the history of the Feuchtwangers has been written by men and men alone. To find traces of the women, we have to look very closely. Let's stick to the hard facts for a moment. We know for sure that the women of the Feuchtwangers married brought substantial money to the family and made the launch of two big family companies possible. The JL Feuchtwanger Bank in Munich and also in Munich, the margarine factory who was owned by the grandfather or established by the grandfather of Leon Feuchtwanger. We also know that these marriages established business relations that were key to making the newly established companies successful. Those matches were not just good catches. They were full-fledged door openers. In a marketing leaflet to merchants in Munich, Jakob Löw Feuchtwanger, I show you Jakob Löw Feuchtwanger, that is him, Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Auguste, so we could have <laughs> decided ourselves if she's ugly or pretty or if it doesn't matter at all. So this is her husband, uh, Jakob Löw Feuchtwanger, the brother of uh, Elkan Feuchtwanger, who was the uh, grandfather of Leon. So in a leaflet to merchants in Munich, Jakob Löw Feuchtwanger announced in the mid-1850s, meine Beziehungen in Frankfurt am Main zu dem Bankhause meines Schwiegervaters, Herrn L. A. Hahn und zu jenen des Herrn S. S. M. Schwarzschild, Schwiegervater meines Bruders, erleichtern meine Transaktionen an diesem Handelsplatze und ich lasse meinen Komitenten, die sich derselben bedienen wollen, diese Begünstigungen gerne zustatten kommen. Feuchtwanger promises that his clients will profit from his good relations to the well-known banking houses Hahn and Schwarzschild in Frankfurt that belong to his father-in-law and the father-in-law of his brother, Moritz. Also, the next generation of Feuchtwangers, the children, nieces and nephews of Auguste Hahn and uh, Jakob Löw Feuchtwanger, used arranged marriages to tie proper relations. Entrepreneurial families often followed the example of the fam famous Habsburg dynasty, Bella Gerand Ali to Felix Austria Nube, let others wage war, though happy Austria marry. Leon Feuchtwanger's father and uncle, for example, married two sisters, Johanna and Sophie Bodenheimer, daughters of a wealthy family in Darmstadt that imported and exported foods. This double connection proved to be very uh, convenient as the Feuchtwangers wanted to revolutionize and the innovative margarine and Kunstbutter sector, artificial butter that was, which, uh, as I can explain, was also came in, came in handy because they were Orthodox Jews, and it was good to have a, like an artificial butter because then you can put on the, the, your bread, the artificial butter, and you can eat meat or cheese, and you don't have to, you know, if you keep your kosher, that's a, that's a big issue. So we know for sure marriage policy played a major role in the ascent of the family during the 19th century. But it is important to stress that the women 
were much more than figures on a chessboard. Mothers and, and brides played an active role in all of that. Already the so-called Stammvater, the patriarch of the family, Seligmann, born in 1786 in Fürth, made a significant step on the social ladder through his marriage with Fanny Wassermann as early as 1880. And I show you Fanny. That's Fanny uh, in her later years. And she looks quite um, respectful. <laughs> <laughs> he was able to take that step because A, his mother Hannah endowed him with 3,000 gulden and B, because according to their Keduba, their marriage contract, Fanny received a dowry of 5,000 gulden and brought along a bridal gift of another 500 gulden. In US dollar, we're talking five figure numbers here. So Seligman's mother, mother's money together with Fanny's dowry formed the couple's starting capital. Fanny, called Vögele, was the daughter of a drapery dealer and financier in the Bavarian town of Wallerstein, who came to considerable wealth during the Napoleonic Wars. She knew quite well how important the connections to her father's businesses were for her husband. She had grown up in a busy merchant house. She had probably worked in the office herself and had helped her brothers and father with keeping the books. So when she moved from Wallerstein to Fürth, she did not do that just as a future wife of Seligmann, but also as his future business partner. Fanny and Seligmann traded gold, silver and brass and after the death of her husband, Fanny was the sole boss of the business for many years. Later, she made two of her son's partners. I show you what I found in the, um, in the archives in Fürth. And there she says, my son Gabriel Feuchtwanger worked for me in my business. Mm -hmm. And it's signed by Fanny herself. I think that it was written by a writer, by an official writer, but she signed it herself, Fanny Feuchtwanger, Firma S. Seligmann in Fürth. So it turns out, equally important as the patriarch of the family was the matriarch. Many women of the Feuchtwanger family in the first half of the century, 19th century and beyond came from wealthy, wealthy entrepreneurial families and had grown up in a time when the separation between private and public had not yet been as sharp as in the late 19th century. In fact, the lines between familial and business affairs have been quite blurry. And even for the later part of the 19th century, one has to question the alleged strict separation between private and business, especially in the context of German Jewish families. The hostile society that surrounded the Jewish minority in the Middle Ages, the early modern age and later, led to strong Jewish family and business ties. One's own brother, son, mother, sister, was in many cases the most trustworthy partner. Another important factor that speaks for a strong involvement of the Feuchtwanger women in business affairs is that the, the frequent absence of many husbands, at least until the late mid 1890s, uh, 50s, sorry. In the extended periods when the men were on business trips, the women were the boss at home and in the office. Regine Feuchtwanger Ellern, sister-in-law of Auguste, for example, kept the books, instructed the staff, dealt with business partners when her husband Heimann was away. The double burden of being a businesswoman and caring, and caring for the ever-growing family was at times too much for the young woman. I quote from a letter to her uh, husband Heimann. Diese Woche, lieber Heimann, sind die Geschäfte nicht sehr angenehm. Was wird da wohl zu machen sein? Ich versichere dich, dass mich diese Angelegenheiten ganz missgestimmt machen. Ich zähle nicht nur die Tage, wirklich die Stunden, bis wir uns wiedersehen. Es ist doch viel angenehmer, wenn man nur seine Ansichten teilen kann, als alles in sich vergraben. We can safely assume that women who were used to being the boss and the contour in many cases met their husband on eye level in family matters as well as in business matters. And as I mentioned, oftentimes the two spheres were inseparable. Um, I don't have a picture of Regine, but I have a picture of uh, just to, that you get a, an idea of what these people looked like and were wearing and 
Um, so this is David uh, Feuchtwanger, who also worked in the margarine factories, was an uncle of Leon. And, and uh, Fanny Feuchtwanger, that's not the same Fanny as I showed you first, another Fanny. David was one of the younger brothers and Fanny um, Feuchtwanger, and they both were uncle and uh, aunt to Leon. No, that's not true. Sorry. <laughs> David is brother of the grandfather of Leon. So. The women, like the men of the family, were in charge of the prosperity of the family, material and spiritual. The Bible and the Jewish tradition know the Eshet Chayil, the woman of valor. She's mentioned in the Proverbs text. I'm reading it to you. A woman of valor who can find. She is more precious than corals. Her husband places his trust in her and profits only thereby. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She seeks out, seeks out wool and flax and cheerfully does the work of her hands. She is like the trading ships, bringing good food from afar. She gets up while it is still night to provide food for her household and a fair share for her staff. She considers a field and purchases it and plants a vineyard with the fruit of her labors. She invests herself with strength and makes her arms powerful. She senses that her trade is profitable. Her light does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her palms hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She has no fear of the snow for her household, for her, all her household is dressed in fine clothing. She makes her own bedspread. Her clothing is of fine linen and luxurious cloth. Her husband is known at the gates where he sits with the elders of the land. She makes and sells linens. She supplies the merchants with sashes. She is roped in strength and dignity, and she smiles at the future. I love that phrasing, to smile at the future. <laughs> Coming back to it later. Eshet Chayil was interpreted in the late 19th century as a praise of the Jewish mother and wife and is viewed so until today. But when we look closely at the text, the woman of Wailer described here is not a well-behaved homemaker, but a badass businesswoman. <laughs> one that invests and calculates, buys and sells, one that tills a field, plans for the future, entertains a house, a woman who clearly is a leader. In this sense, the women of the Feuchtwanger family were truly women of valor. Of course, over the decades, their role also changed. The bustling businesswoman of the first half of the 19th century that spent a good part of the day in the office dealing with clients and staff were more and more replaced by the elegant ladies of the house. The women of the upper class slowly turned from producer to consumer, as I stated before, the separation between public and private in many entrepreneurial Jewish families was never as strict as in fam families of civil servants or in military families of the upper class. But now in the Feuchtwanger family too, it was the husbands who left each morning to spend their days in the office. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, the women of the family were leaders of representative houses at excellent addresses in the city of Munich. There we see Johanna again, Johanna Feuchtwanger and Sigmund, the parents of Leon Feuchtwanger, of course, you know already. The companies did well. The family enjoyed a growing wealth. Each household consisted not only of a considerable number of children, Leon Feuchtwanger had eight siblings, but also a number of servants, a cook, maids, women who came for laundry day, a seamstress, the Jewish private tutor, who taught the boys the Aleph Bet, the Gemara and Mishnah. Leon's brother, Martin, gives an impressive portrayal of his parental home at St. Anna Platz in Munich. Their mother, Johanna, held a strict regiment, not only over the servants, but also over her children and husband. As a matter of course, the servants had to know every detail of the Jewish law, especially regarding uh, Shabbat and Kashrut, uh, the day um, of uh, well, the, the seventh day, uh, Shabbat, and also the Kashrut, the, the law for, for eating to separate milk and, and meat. 
But Johanna Feuchtwanger certainly also expected them to go to church every Sunday. Piousness and respect for the religion of the house was an unnegotiable requirement. And it was Johanna's task to watch over it. No doubt, the Feuchtwanger women worked equally as hard as the men that the family took the shift from Wirtschafts to Bildungsbürgertum in the late 19th century. Leon reports that his mother was ambitious for him and would have loved to see him take on an academic, academic career. The sons were sent to the elitist uh, Wilhelmsgymnasium in Lehel, at Lehel, it's a part of uh, Munich. Um, to know your Goethe and Schiller was equally important as knowing the Torah. In Leon's generation, the term Eshet Chayil obtained yet another component. The women of his generation, born in the, late, in the 1880s and later, not only made sure that the family's bu family businesses thrived and that their kids grew up to be good Jews, in the threatening times of revolution, counter-revolution, inflation, Hitler putsch, and the horror that began with the Nazi rise to power in 1933, many of the Feuchtwanger women proved to be true lifesavers. Oftentimes, it was the wives that realized earlier than the husbands that there was no future in Germany. Maybe because the men were too caught up in the daily business of the office or the Jewish community. Maybe because the men simply could not envision themselves in another position or context than Herr Bankdirektor, Herr Fabrikdirektor, Herr Justizrat, Herr Verleger. Maybe because the women witnessed much closer the misery of their children facing discrimination at school and on the streets had to comfort a broke, heartbroken son or daughter that was not long, no longer allowed into a sports club or the local pool. In any case, it is noticeable that the women of the family urged to leave Germany. Leon's Zionist sisters Henny and Mehdi emigrated to Palestine with their families even before 1933. Um, here's, um, I wanted to show you, that's probably all know the picture already, that's the, all the Feuchtwanger children, the, the daughters and sons of um, Johanna and Sigmund. And it's a very bourgeois, they all wear their matrosen um, hemd and, uh, and the, the girls have their big, um, their big hairdo. And that, that's another um, relative, Eli Strauss, and I'll be talking about him and his wife soon and that's his family and you also see the very um, yeah, good bürgerliche setting. Rachel Strauss, that's her, wife of Leon's cousin Ellie, also was a true pioneer in many senses. At the beginning of the 20th century, she had come from Heidelberg, where she had studied, to Munich as one of the first female physicians in town, had opened a doctor's office for gynecology. An orthodox woman herself, she was a vocal fighter for sexual education, contraception, and, if necessary, safe abortion. She was also a strong believer in gender equality and women's suffrage. In spring, spring 1933 was hard for Rachel, not just because of the political developments, but also because of her husband, who was dying of cancer. He died shortly after Pesach that year, so she was alone with the hard decision that had to be made. The fate of her family lay in her hands. In her memoirs, she, in her memoirs, she writes, Die Tage und Wochen, die folgten, sind mir nur noch heute in wirrer, schwerer, wie ein wirrer, schwerer Traum. Man tut fast nachtwandlerisch, was nötig ist, aber man lebt nicht. Ja, man fühlt nicht einmal. Langsam erst spürt man die Leere um sich, die sich nie wieder füllt, die große Einsamkeit. Aber das Leben fordert sein Recht. Es fordert in diesen Tagen Entscheidungen weitragender Bedeutung. Ich hatte nur einen Wunsch, München und Deutschland so schnell wie möglich zu verlassen. Es gab nur eine Entscheidung, Palästina, Eretz, Israel, für die Kinder und für mich. Neue Heimat, neue Lebensmöglichkeit. And there you see her again. 
that was in the yeah in the mid uh, war period that was she somewhere in Holland in summer 1933 the 53-year-old uh, gynecologist together with her children embarked on a ship to Palestine started over and opened a doctor's office in Jerusalem Uh, we know her story because she wrote a very interesting memoir called Belebten in Deutschland, um, which is at the LBI, but I think it was also published in the 60s. Um, ten years younger than Rachel, but also committed to finding a new home abroad after the new regime had made life impossible in Germany, Martha Feuchtwanger tried to get out as much of their Berlin home as possible. Martha's pragmatism, efficiency and yes, valor are legendary. First in France, later here in California, she managed to install her husband and herself. Again and again, she built a little world around them that was inspiring and yet calm enough for Leon to continue to be creative and write. She was an indispensable advisor to Leon, crea um, created a place that would quickly become a center in the immigrant colony, performed as a marvelous hostess. You know her already. Um, and more than once, she actually saved Leon's life. Unforgettable the episode when in summer 1940, she visited him in the internment camp in Nîmes in France. She herself had just fled from Camp de Gour. Martha understood very well that time was of the essence. With the Germans approaching, Leon had to get out of France immediately. Martha traveled to Marseille to meet the American consul. Masses of people queued in front of the building. Martha just passed them, ignoring their hissing and ranting. It was hard, but it had to be done. Martha remembers. Als ich dort ankam, wartete bereits eine große Menschenmenge. Viele Straßen entlang. Es herrschte die glühende Hitze und viele wurden ohnmächtig. Aber ich konnte mich nicht anstellen. Man sagte, um fünf würden alle weggeschickt. Das war jeden Tag so. Ich musste Leon retten und durfte keine Zeit verlieren. Well, it is no secret that Leon Feuchtwanger's view on gender roles was, let's say, mostly, mostly conventional. Although he and Martha liked to emphasize that they lived like bohemians, their formal marriage arrangements in large parts were pretty bourgeois. The husband's career was given priority over everything else, and the wife was expected to shield him from the ugly trivialities of everyday life. In an interview Marta gave when she was already widowed for a long time in the 1970s, she stated that Leon had always found that women should be only for luxury. She had to be pretty and take care of the needs of her husband. In return, the husband provided a suitable lifestyle. In many respects, Marta and Leon lived by those standards. But of course, Leon knew very well that Marta was much more than a beautiful muse and a diligent homemaker. Without her, chances are he would not have managed to get out of the devil's France at all. Not only, as we learned in Birgit's talk on Thursday night, did Marta watch over his legacy after his death and thus shaped the memory of him and the reception of his work? She coined the image of Leon Feuchtwanger from the beginning. The brand Leon Feuchtwanger was managed by Marta for decades. So the rescue story of Marta and Leon Feuchtwanger certainly is a spectacular one. But in one way or the other, many women of the Feuchtwanger family saved their families during the years of persecution. The Holocaust put an end to the centuries-long history of the Feuchtwangers in Germany. The family members that survived were scattered all over the world, in Palestine, Israel, England, the US, South America. And oftentimes, it was the women who tackled the challenges as we heard in the, in the uh, talk earlier. Um, while many men grieved about uh, lost careers and opportunities, their wives often proved to be more adaptable and pragmatic. And that's also what we learned from not just the Feuchtwanger family, but other uh, exile studies. 
So um, I, I would I, I would argue um, the what what Leon Feuchtwanger wrote that the man is the one who gets along quite well in exile and the woman is the one who fails um, is pretty um, fresh in a way um, mm -hmm. when you when we look at the actual stories of very um, many uh, families in exile and also um, I would argue his own situation with Marta who managed everything and everything. Um, so it is rough situations like that that call for a true Eshet Chayil, a true women of valor. Also in situations almost impossible, where it's also almost impossible to smile at the future to come back uh, to the proverbs formulation. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we have a few minutes. If anybody has questions or wants to discuss it, oh no. <laughs> um, yeah, very intriguing. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about Rahel, because if I heard you correctly, she was already 53 at the time when she went to Palestine with her family. And um, it struck me because very often um, people who went into exile, be it you know, not Palestine or the United States or elsewhere, um, the more advanced they were in age, the more difficult it was uh, for them to establish a career. So how did she do? Um, her advantage was that she was a very strong believer in Zionism. She was a she was absolutely convinced that the future of the Jewish people is in uh, Eretz Israel. She wanted to emigrate to, uh, she wanted to make Aliyah uh, already before World War I. And she uh, visited Palestine with her husband Eli uh, in 1909, I think. Uh, but Eli was uh, reluctant. And also because he had his career in, in Germany, he was a, he was a lawyer. Um, and she was, a, uh, she was a physician. She knew that she would be needed in this country to be country, well, not a country yet, uh, of his own no, no nation state. Um, so um, I think that was a big advantage. Uh, but still, there are reports that she had difficulties there uh, because of the language, of course, because she was in her 50s. Uh, so she gave up uh, her, her practice after, I think, two or three years. Uh, but she worked in charity and was uh, she, she was very old when she died. And she was a, had her own circle around her social circle. She had an open house uh, in Jerusalem and had all her children with her. And the fact that she could, she, that she left so early allowed her to take a lot of uh, her belongings with her uh, and also money. Um, and they had the bank. So the, 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 I didn't mention that, but uh, um, there were relatives who left in the mid thirties. Uh, who established a Feuchtwanger bank in Palestine. Uh, and that helped a lot because then they had their belongings and their, their, their money uh, in, in Tel Aviv. Well, with this, let's give Heike a round. Dear friends, liebe Freunde, as we are nearing the end uh, of our days here, I'd say we have the Beretes Streitgespräch gehabt, uh, which I wished at the start for us to have and which Feuchtwanger longed for in his own exile. And we, are, I think we are leaving with many new ideas uh, and set on new research, new projects and an enthusiasm for the next conference. And as has been pointed out by Roland, uh, there is no need uh, why we couldn't have other Feuchtwanger events before London uh, in 2024. Uh, if any of you have ideas for shorter events uh, in connection with other writers or just Feuchtwanger focus, please uh, Bring them up. Uh, the big uh, benefit uh, of internet technology is that we can all share such ideas immediately and get into the discussion. Then I also want to thank from the bottom of my heart our organizers here for making all this happen and carrying the majority of the burden of making it happen. Uh, most of all, and it can't be said often enough, Michaela and Mari. Please another applause for them.
also our kind hosts here, of course, Claudia and uh, our guide through the room. <laughs> uh, and finally, the staff both at the USC and here. Uh, yes, and that's that's how. <laughs> I just think uh, it really helps to show that we appreciate it. That's why I wanted to list it. And thank you for attending, for debating, um, for discussing, and for continuing to read about Feuchtwanger, about the other excerpts, uh, about so many interesting writers, some of whom I hadn't heard uh, before. And I think that's true for more than uh, just me for before this conference. And that's why I really love Tagungen like this, uh, because they always uh, give me new ideas, new people to look up, new writers to discover. Uh, and I hope we will have many, many more of these. Uh, I also look forward to reading now the volume of the Munich um, Tagung, uh, going back in mind there and uh, reading the long versions of various speeches. Uh, and, you know, uh, get going with the written version of your speeches here. And remember, there doesn't have to be the 20 minutes limit uh, for the written versions. Maya and Michaela, I'm sure, appreciate being sent these essays sooner rather than later. Uh, so we ha can have the uh, new volume uh, ready for England. And uh, once again, thank you for being here. And let's all uh, look forward now to our next meeting, wherever and whenever it will be, but at the very latest in 2024.